What's up, sons? It's Blind Rod with Son of the Tech. Once again, and joining me today is Austin Childress with Crypto Miner CHR. You can find him on Twitter at Crypto Miner CHR, and we'll have the links down in the description below. Today, uh, he is going to be going over some ASIC miner repair. What board are we looking at right here right now? This would be an S17 Plus board. All right. And give us an idea of some of the overview of the equipment that you need to utilize to do any of this work. Uh, soldering iron, it looks like. Yeah, so you at least need the heat gun if you're want to do gun. reworking. Okay. Uh, you're definitely going to need a multimeter. Okay. You have a power supply test jig right here. Okay. Uh, got a microscope to see all the small components if your eyes aren't all that good. And cool. Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, where can people, or you are one of the kind of most known guys around the ASIC miner repair, right? Uh, where can people find you outside of just Twitter? Do you guys have a website or anything uh, like yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I have a website. You can find me almost on any channel, Crypto okay. Miner CHR. And, cool. Uh, a YouTube channel? I do have a as YouTube well? as cool. well, Perfect. yeah. We'll link all that down in the description. So do you want to get into it and show me how this is done? And kind of yeah. get my so, hands I mean, I'll let you get your hands dirty. I'd say uh, first thing is definitely uh, you need to learn signal flow. All right, so let me get, we're gonna move the camera so they can see the board, I think, and then good. you'll tell me what signal flow is and all that. Today's sponsor is BT Miners. Purchasing mining equipment online can be dangerous. With all of the fake storefronts and scams, it can be hard to find a reliable source. That's why when BT Miners reached out for a channel sponsorship, I started by verifying that ordering and delivery went smoothly with a purchase of my own. If you are looking to purchase ASICs hardware from Bitcoin to Dogecoin miners, they are available for purchase on bt-miners.com. BT Miners is a trusted source by both asicminervalue.com and CryptoMiner.com. Follow the affiliate link in the description and tell them Soat sent you to support the channel. So what's the first thing we need to know? Yeah, so with signal flow, uh, you have your power terminals here. So this is your positive, this is your negative. Your negative is always gonna be right next to your IO data port. Okay. So this is where all the signal goes back and forth between the hash board and the control board. Right. Uh, from here, uh, you have your other main circuit. So this is your DC to DC circuit. It has your pick chip. Okay. And that pretty much controls the board, all the voltage information. Okay. And then you have your EEPROM right next to it. So Got that it. EEPROM, it stores like the serial number, the bin number. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a bin two board. So that's another important thing. Okay. Wait, Bas what's the important thing? Uh, the bin number, as oh, well as got like, the serial number. So all the information stored on your EEPROM. Right. Okay. And so your PIC chip, it turns on your board through these MOS chips okay. right here. So your voltage flows in, and then it goes to the rest of the board as well as to your boost circuit. So your boost circuit steps up the voltage, and then that powers the last few domains. Domains would be a group of ASIC chips. So okay. these are your LDOs right here. What does LDO stand for? Low dropout. Okay. It's a voltage regulator. So it takes all that voltage and it just spreads it evenly across the different domains. Across the chip. Okay. Domain. So domains here. Yeah, this would be LDOs one domain, here. two domains, three domains. Okay. So th these LDOs power this domain. Right. And so okay. on and so forth. Got it. And these are the ASIC chips here? Correct. Or under the yeah, heat sinks? So yes, the ASIC chips should be under the heat sinks right, right here. Here, right, okay. Cool. Yeah, and then you also have uh, right here is gonna be your clock crystal oscillator. And that's gonna show you exactly where your first chip is. Okay, how yeah. does that work? So the clock crystal oscillator is kind of like a timer it okay. sets the frequency of the board. And wherever that is on the board is where your first chip is. Or the first chip of the group. So sometimes there's more the than one on a, on a board. Depending on the model and all that. Exactly. Okay. So the, if you were trying to identify the first chip in the, uh, well, yeah. In the group. In the group, you would look for that. The specific, oscillator. Uh, the oscillator. Okay, cool. And that shows the first chip. And your boost will usually be close to where your last chip is, which is right here. Up right here. And what does the boost look like? This is the boost. Okay, got it. Yeah, that one in the center there is your main IC. That's your step up IC. Okay. 
lots of different components as well. You got capacitors, you got an inductor, that's that silver one there. Got resistors, diodes. That's all familiar from most PC components. So yep. I think most people will be. And then as far as the signal flows, um, all the signals go from the first chip okay. and it snakes around and goes all the way to the last chip. Okay. Once it gets to the last chip, there's always a, what I call the return signal. Okay. Uh, the RO on this board, so it goes from the last chip and carries all the information going through the temperature sensors along the way, which there is four of them. There's one, two, and then they're underneath the heat sinks here. Okay. So this is going to be your intake and your exhaust. So that return signal goes from that last chip and goes through all the temperature sensors, collecting all the temperature data, all the hashing data, and finally gets to the uh, first chip, and then it goes out to the control board. Gotcha. So is that an overview of pretty much all of the components on, on the hash board? That would be the major components. And so then the next question would be, what's the most common failure? Just about everything. <laughs> everything, okay. <laughs> so there's not goes. one more that, one more than other, others? That you yeah, find I mean, a lot of people with. think it might just be the ASIC and just switching the ASIC. Sometimes it can even be this really small capacitor or resistor that's in between uh, okay. in circuit. Um, but it just really comes down to diagnostic. Uh, the way I teach it is, is you have basically three different uh, levels of repair uh, when it comes to diagnostic. So first would be the dreaded zero ASIC. It's not showing the hash board, nothing's showing up. Right. So basically all that is, is it's your return signal is getting disrupted somewhere and it's not coming back to the control board. Okay. So in order to fix that, we want to start on the last chip, see if we have an RO signal. Okay. Uh, if that return signal's not there, then okay, let's check the LDO, which would be over here. Right, and okay. if the LDO doesn't have power, well, what powers the last few LDOs? That would be the boost. Okay. So you yeah. check your boost for voltage. It's not given the proper step up voltage. Maybe it's zero. Okay. So then you test after the MOS. Oh, the MOS isn't opening up. So then you test over here and you find out that your power supply isn't even plugged in. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So you just want to kind of follow that flow of the signal. Right. And try to pinpoint where that break or So that's if the board's not recording at all. Correct. That would right. be zero ASIC. And then, and then from if there there's you would some get, ASIC, then you know that you're getting power and you can, that's why you need to know the first and the last because then you can count down and find yep. the ASIC that's malfunctioning. So if it says 10 ASIC, for example, yeah. you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So you, with some ASIC, let's say 10 ASIC here, yeah. you want to make sure to test the ASIC before it, the ASIC itself, as well as the ASIC after it. Now, why do you test it? I mean, why, 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 why do you test the before and the after? Because even though it's reporting 10 ASIC, maybe the signal is broken here, but it's still reporting this 10th it. ASIC. Or okay. maybe it's after, and this is the problem chip, so you're finding all 10. A lot of people, they think, oh, 10 ASIC, just replace that chip. But that's um, not always the case. Not so always you'll, the case. Che you'll check the voltage, uh, as w or how do you check that and confirm it's the 10 ASIC version? Yeah, so once after? you have some ASIC, it's best not even to plug it in at that point. Okay. Uh, now you can take your multimeter and you can switch it to diode mode. Okay. So you have the diode symbol there. And now you can take your red lead, goes on the ground. And you take your black lead and that goes on the test point, which is okay. kind of opposite of what you learn. But you can ground here on the chip or right here. Okay. And then you go to the test point, which would be before. So you just test every single test point. Okay. And what are you looking for on the uh, multimeter? You're looking for it to be in the similar range. In similar ranges of each other, correct? Correct. So you okay. can take a known working board and just get those values off, off of, it, of it or go to another domain and check, oh, okay, well, right. that's what the average should be. Got you. Okay. And then if and you then have... And if there's a broken point or you find the malfunctioning ASIC, you use a heat gun to remove that? Yeah. So then you would do a rework. Okay. Um, 
if it's out of range. Is it similar to like the idea of like flow, like reflowing a board or whatever? Yeah, so I, I came up with what I call what rework is, is the three R's. Okay. So what you want to do is you do a reflow, which that's where you just add some flux, melt everything uh -huh. up, and right. then you let it cool. Okay. If that doesn't work, then you do the same thing, melt everything up, but this time you do a reseat. Okay. So you take the chip off, inspect everything, and then place the chip back Not this similar from like uh, troubleshooting a regular PC with a CPU, right? You pull the CPU out, reseat it, make sure everything's connected yeah. if it doesn't work. Yeah, okay, cool. And then from there you just do a replace. Awesome. And then as far as the other, when you're doing the testing, like obviously if you're testing for the ASIC chip, you said like multimeter, we set to diode. Um, you have a power supply over here in case you need to do further testing. What are you utilizing the power supply to test? And when does that need to be? Like yeah, added so in? when you're testing voltage, um, let's say okay. you tested the these in diode and that, resistance. So that would be if it was resistance the, is good. Okay. So now we can go ahead and plug it in, and maybe it was out of range, and we reworked it, and now it's back in range. So then you can plug everything in and run the test, a diagnostic test on it, yeah. and actually test the voltage on those test okay. points. Okay. Cool. So then you'd switch this over to DC voltage. Right. And now you can test your voltage. So it's all, yeah, all direct current through it. And then what are the voltage ranges on this? Is it going to be like 12 volt? Uh, no. So, I mean, the ASICs themselves run off of about 0.8 volts and 1.8 okay. volts. Some right. of the newer okay. ones are running off of 1.2 volts. But coming into the board off of, it would come, because it yeah, comes, it comes into... in here, and it just depends on the board itself. Okay. Uh, anywhere from 12 and 24 volts. Okay. And then each ASIC chip's gonna be somewhere between 0.8 and 1 volt on this example. For the signals, yeah. Right, okay, okay. Got it, cool. Awesome. Yeah, and then when you're doing a rework, you wanna make sure to take the top heat sink off first. And you definitely don't wanna to forget to take off the bottom heat sink second. And then now you can go ahead and rework the ASIC chip. So top, okay, top heat, heat sink first, bottom heat sink, uh, uh, heat sink second. Why is that? Because uh, if you um, take off the bottom heat sink first, for example, and then you're trying to do the top, it can end up melting all the solder that is holding the chip in place. And then now you're taking the ASIC off with it when with the chip. you didn't want to do that. Okay. So <laughs> that, that, for PC building, that's not dissimilar than the, you know, the, a, the AMD CPUs that had the pins on them. Yeah. You get the, you get the heat sink stuck on it. You go to pull the heat sink off and you pull the chip off with it. <laughs> It reminds me of that. Okay, that makes sense then. Cool. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to point out or that uh, maybe I'm missing? I don't have all the questions because it's not my expertise, so let me know. Uh, what I mean, what we kind of went through a basic rundown on signal flow. Perfect, um, okay. As far as reworking the chip, uh, we could do an example if you wanted. Sure, let's do it. So for this board, we want to do around 380 degrees Celsius. Okay. On the newer boards, it's around 420, 450 degrees Celsius. Okay. Uh, they use a higher temp solder. So when you're grabbing the chip, you always want to do it from this angle. You don't want to do it from this side. Okay. Because you got all these really small components right here that you can knock, and then now they're missing and just cause havoc. So, so it's best to it. come from this, this angle. Okay. You can literally go like right on top of the chip when you start. Okay. So when it's ready, it's ready. You don't want to just force it off. You'll feel it kind of break yeah. loose. And you Which... also want to be careful of scratching the board. Okay. Because if you accidentally do that and then solder flows over, you'll cause a short circuit that's basically impossible. Because of all the traces, right, on the board? Okay. You also want to be very careful not to burn the board. So you can't overheat the board, causing it to discolor, blister. Now, is there an orientation that has to go back in on? There is. If you look and at the you, chip, it has one big square, and then it has a smaller rectangle at the top. And then that lines, okay. And then you just line it up with the pins on the board. So the best way to do it is, is to roll it off and roll it back on. Okay. So I usually start at one angle right here, and I try to get it right on that line, 
and okay. perfectly angled, and then you just roll it straight down. Okay. You don't want to shift it around like this because then all the solder is going to go everywhere. Yeah. So it's better to roll it back up and then roll and it straight back And you just keep extra down. flux or, and solder on hand? Or yeah, whatever. you can add more flux. Okay. I'm just showing this as an example. Yeah. So if you're going to reseat, you would roll it, on, roll, roll it off, roll it back on. Then you also want to make sure it fully melts. So you hold the the gun on there a little bit longer. Yeah, okay. finish it off. You can even push straight down on the chip. Okay. Cool. And then you'd want to do a diode test. test, so probably should have did that before. Right. And it looks like it's a little high. So that means that there's not enough solder. So you would, add more, you would add more flux at that point? Yeah, you can try that, uh, take it off, inspect the pads, make sure that there's enough solder. You can always add a little more solder. Okay. That one's shorted out, so we probably have a short circuit. So one of those two pins are actually soldered together. Right. Okay. That's why you don't really want to shift it all around, because then you can remove some solder or add too much solder in one yeah. area. Um, cool. And you're going around training people on this for uh, new facilities and that sort of thing, right? Yeah, new facilities, old facilities, independents. Okay. Just training a whole bunch of different people in the And that's going to be a pretty high uh, demand job, you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, right now there's not enough technicians. I don't think right. there will be for the next five, ten years. So technicians, um, probably not a bad business to get into, like learning ASIC repair at this time? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, a lot of these hosting facilities, they don't have enough staff to actually take care of your machines while they right. have them running. And if somebody wanted to get into that, what, where could they look to, to start? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, places that are now starting to open up. Um, one of the first was Bitmain with their AMTC training. So right. you can get certified by Bitmain. Okay. Um, they have an online in-person course. Um, there's a lot of other companies now that are coming out with uh, their own courses as well. Cool. Um, or you can just hire me to come out yeah. and I do consulting do and training, consulting. Uh, cool. either in person or virtually. So Awesome. And they can, we already went over that Twitter stuff. Here, I'll put the <laughs> camera down. We'll wrap it up. Thanks for that example. Yeah. Works. So you're saying uh, people can hire you for consulting to come out, uh, train technicians if they like, um, on site, that sort of thing. You do that? Correct. Okay, cool. And they can find you on uh, at your website that we'll leave link down below that we talked about earlier, or of course on the Twitter. And then, uh, is there anything else that we're missing that we need to get caught up on? Uh, I mean, I know there's a Discord channel that's getting pretty popular for the repair. Okay. Um, Ant miner repair. Okay. So there's a lot of technicians on there that help everybody out and cool. kind of answer questions and. For additional content that also goes into more opinionated pieces surrounding the politics around crypto, make sure you check out sonofattack.locals.com. There you can become a member for free or even choose to support for basically additional content at $5 a month. It's helping me stay alive through the crypto winter.